Welcome once again, folks, to the Hour of the Time and our ongoing series of the exposure of the origins, the history, the doctrine, and the identity of Mystery Babylon. I'm William Cooper. Many of you have written letters and asked, how does one get into the Mystery School since no one ever hears anything about it? And there appears not to be a campaign of recruitment, and you're absolutely right. In our research, we have found the requirements to be simple. Be of sound mind and body. Have a sincere desire to be illumined and simply knock up on the door. Well, to continue, remember that the first religion in the world was the religion of the worship of the heavens. And man eventually came to recognize the sun as the representation of the power and the ability of the hidden God of the universe, the invisible God of the universe, the all-powerful creator of everything. But man, as he gained his intellectual ability, began to look toward himself, toward the intellect as that God and the sun, the representation of what used to be the invisible God of the universe, then became the representation of the intellect, the light, Lucifer. And man began to worship the Luciferian philosophy. He believed, these people who call themselves the guardians of the secrets of the ages, and still believe that man was held prisoner in the Garden of Eden by an unjust, vindictive, and very cruel God, the God of the Bible and that he was set free from the bonds of ignorance through the gift of intellect given to him by Lucifer through his agent, Satan. Now, many people believe that Lucifer and Satan are the same individual entity, and they may be. I don't know the answer to that. I just know what the mystery schools believe, and I know what I personally believe, and what I personally believe doesn't have any bearing on anything. Knowledge, the truth is what counts and that's what we're trying to get to the bottom of here now eventually this philosophy of worshiping worshiping the intellect or wisdom or the mind became known as Gnosticism and the followers of Gnosticism began to be known as the Gnostics in extraordinary number folks of exceedingly bizarre talismans and inscribed stones bear witness to the power of the secret Gnostic organizations which flourished in various forms during the few centuries immediately before and after the rise of Christianity in the Middle East. You see, one of the oddest emblems of these schools was the figure of Abraxas. Now that's a human body clothed in a Roman soldier's garb wielding a battle axe as if threatening an enemy. Now in its left hand it carried an elliptical shield upon which the words of power IAO and Saboeth were sometimes written. The head of this fearsome being was that of a cock with open beak. Now that symbolized the rising of the morning sun because the cock crows with the sunrise. For legs it had twin serpents. The serpent throughout history has always been a symbol for wisdom, the gift of intellect coiling to either side. Underneath the figure sometimes lay a conventionalized thunderbolt. Now who was Abraxas? His name in accordance with Kabbalistic computation is decoded to mean 365. Isn't it 
absolutely incredible that every single time we investigate one of these, it leads directly to the sun. For 365 days, or the number of days in the year, or the exact number of days that it takes the earth to make one revolution around the sun. Amazing. There was no god or idol belonging to the society, and this is where man made the transition from worshipping a god to worshipping the mind. The Abraxas figure merely represented the aspects of power which went to make up the supreme intelligence, the all-power. The body was man himself. The bird stood for intelligence and the hailing of light, illumination, which is the cock's habit at dawn. The tunic represented the need for struggle or revolution, socialism. The arms, the protection and power given by the dedication to the gnosis or knowledge. The shield was wisdom, the club or whip, power. The two snakes meant noose, insight, and logos, understanding, primordial knowing, which was the gift from Satan, the snake, the serpent. By means of this diagram, Gnostic teachers inculcated the theory that man comes to his full power by developing certain facets of his mind. He must struggle to arrive at gnosis. But this knowledge is of the mystical kind and is not the mere collection of facts. You see, great stress was laid upon personal mystical experience to and through which the initiate was guided under conditions of great secrecy. The Gnostics did not confine their studies or their teachings to any one religion, but borrowed illustrations from all that were accessible to them. This caused them to be considered Christians, heretics, Jews who were trying to undermine Christianity, remnants of the Persian sun worshippers. They have been widely studied by early Christian sages, and it is upon the opinions of these latter that many conclusions have been formed. Little or no investigation of these, quote, people of wisdom, unquote, has been done by research workers on the spot in Asia and North Africa, where strong and interesting traces of their beliefs and practices still remain. The main teaching states that there is a supreme being or power which is invisible and has no perceptible form. It is pantheism. This power is the one which can be contacted by mankind, and it is through it that man can control himself and work out his destiny. The various religious teachers through the ages, putting their creeds in many different ways, were in contact with this power they claim, and their religions all contain a more or less hidden kernel of initiation. Now this is the secret which the knowers can communicate to their disciples. But the secret can be acquired only through exercising the mind and body until the terrestrial man is so refined as to be able to become a vehicle for the use of this power, or, in their terms, illumined. Eventually, the initiate becomes identified with the power, and in the end he attains his true destiny as purified personality, infinitely superior to the rest of unenlightened mankind to the state of apotheosis where he himself is God. The symbolism in which this teaching is concealed, the methods by which the mystical power is attained, vary from one Gnostic society to another, but the constant factor is there the attainment of that which humankind unconsciously needs. You see, the Gnostic claims that within every man and woman there is an unfulfilled urge which cannot be given any proper expression in the normal way because there is no social means by which it can be fulfilled. This feeling has been put into man in order that he may seek the fulfillment which the Gnostics can give him his search for completeness in love, trade, professions, theology, is vain and unsuccessful. The theories of the various schools, folks, of Gnosticism with which the Christian clerics came into contact are very much secondary to the rituals and practices which are used to produce the Gnosis, the Enlightenment, the Illumination. This has not been fully understood by too many people who devote much space 
in trying to work out the beliefs of the knowers by a perusal of their writings or by reports which have been given them by others simply folks because they do not understand the symbolism it is not clear to them it is veiled it is the esoteric wisdom what were and are the Gnostic practices well first discipleship and the inculcated belief that the initiate must struggle must devote himself as much as possible to the identification with the power which inspires all secondly there are two kinds of men those who are bound to the earth and to matter and those who can refine themselves it is from the latter class that aspirants are chosen they claim in every instance that we've investigated they may choose them from the latter class but they all end up in the first thirdly the methods by which the divine illumination may come are many and varied and it is the province of the teacher to choose which path he will give to his disciple to follow some Gnostics believe that frenzy and excitement would produce the necessary liberation of the mind from the fetters of the body remember the Sphinx others consider that this could be done best by fasting and meditation present-day Gnostic practice in the East has it that different methods suit different temperaments and this could be one cause for the historical confusion as to which branch of heretics practiced what the Gnostics believed themselves to be intellectual aristocrats their knowledge was only for the few who were ready to receive it and that's why they do not recruit you must knock at the door and you and only you know when you're ready to receive it and this is what made them a secret cult not the fear of persecution they had their own passwords and shaking hands they tickled the palm as an identification signal and they helped one another in every conceivable way just as Freemasons do today for they are one and the same as they have always been one and the same with all the different versions of the mystery throughout the ages now some say that they could not be called pantheists because they considered that the doctrine was secondary to the experience of religion and the theologians and ordinary priesthood of any religion did not approve of that they were not in fact a religion like most others because they stressed the importance of the individual before that of the community those who were more enlightened were more important in every possible way because they were valuable refined aristocrats at the same time they taught that providing the well-being of the Gnostics was assured so was that of the community at large and this meant that they could subscribe to the outward doctrines of any religion and could continue to operate under many different political religious systems Gnosticism profoundly influenced men's minds even in Europe up to and after the Middle Ages and its basic way of thinking is probably an underlying factor in other secret societies whose members would be surprised to know it because the pyramidal organizational structure of the membership of these organizations means that nobody below the top the very top really knows anything of the true religion and goals of the society to which they belong and so these people could truly be said to be the greatest group of followers and fools in the history of the world for they think that they are illumined but in fact they are never given any real secrets and only those at the top truly know what is really going on terrible obscenities and other crimes have been laid at the door of the Gnostics by the early ecclesiastical writers although there is little doubt that some of them did believe in max mass ecstasy it seems unlikely that their secrets were well enough known to enable the commentators to assess them and in most cases 
whenever the commentators tried to assess them, they were assessing the exoteric or the appearance, but not the esoteric or the real truth of the object of the worship of the Gnostics. The belief that certain special men could control their destiny and obtain extra powers through dedication to Gnostic practices meant that inevitably there was a belief in magic. Remember on previous shows we discussed that belief in magic? Magic is real, folks. I have seen it work. It is not to be played with or laughed at or scoffed about. It is dangerous, extremely dangerous. The myriad Gnostic gems are inscribed stones decorated with serpents, Kabbalistic names, and the rest are more likely to be proofs of initiation and talismans than mere identification tokens presented to ensure admission to meetings, as some authors have thought. The reason for supposing this is that, one, the gems are very similar in many respects to talismans in use by other communities including the Egyptians, and two, they can often be interpreted as containing magical messages or diagrammatical invocations. Ethically speaking, Gnostic belief is that there are two principles, that of good and evil. A balance must be struck between these forces, and the balance is in the hands of the Gnostic, the knower, partly because nobody else can tell whether an action is for the eventual good of the individual or the community. And this secret knowledge comes through the mystical insight which the supermen Gnostics attained. There's that reference to a super race or a superman again, which always crops up with these people, as it did with Hitler and many others. The rise of individuals who wrongly believed that they had attained to Gnosis, all knowledge, some of whom were leaders of Gnostic societies, produced very notorious characters. Those who followed the way of the Ophite branch glorified the serpent who tempted Eve, and they still do that today. They did this because this snake, by his actions, brought knowledge into the world, gave man the gift of intellect, the use of which will bring him to the state of apotheosis, where man himself will be God. Basilides was a leader who taught that Jesus did not die on the cross, and you will see this crop up all through the history of the mystery schools, even in the Knights Templar. Since matter and material things were considered to be a part of the inferior non-spiritual world, the sect known as the Cainites called upon everyone to destroy those things which belonged to the world, and they called themselves the destroyers, and their god is the destroyer. These deviations and aberrants have attracted the greatest attention, as is natural, and the quieter teachers of the creed have received less attention. The pious horror with which the less respectable Gnostics were viewed by the early Christian fathers has stamped itself forever on Western literature and belief about the, quote, enlightened ones, unquote. But in more than one place, in the Middle East, as well as in small groups in Western Europe. There are still followers of various schools of Gnosticism. They mainly follow the ideas held by Valentinus, with some variations. And this school teaches its initiates that matter is more evil than good, that man must be purified by mental concentration, that after death, man will rejoin that from which he has been severed and will be unified with those whom he loves in the great intelligence. They also believe that all matter will eventually be destroyed by fire. And if they have their way, that could be absolutely true. The Mandeans, a small but tenacious community which dwells in Iraq, follow an ancient form of Gnosticism which practices initiation, ecstasy, and some rituals which have been said to resemble those of the Freemasons. And of course they do, because they are. <laughs> In every Masonic temple you will see somewhere up on the wall a big letter G. 
And you will see it in their symbology, in their books. You will see this letter G. And if you ask a Freemason, being bound to the oath never to tell you or reveal the secrets to the profane, which is what they call those who are not initiates or adepts in the mysteries, he will tell you that it stands for God, but that is a lie. It does not stand for God, for I have researched it deeply all the way up the ladder of the stages of initiation. And at the top, those adepts known as the priesthood know this large letter G to represent Gnosticism. And it is an admission that they are indeed the recipients of the ancient Gnostic. They are Gnostics, and they are looking to attain the Gnosis, through which they will receive apotheosis. And they believe that they are the only ones in the world who possess truly mature minds, and thus are the only ones in the world capable of ruling the rest of us, whom they refer to as cattle. Cattle. Well, it's time to take a break, folks. Don't go away. I'll be right back after this very short pause. A most detailed account of what was said to be the seven highest degrees of secret Egyptian initiation was first published in Germany in the 18th century. This strange and very exhaustive document combines many elements from the ancient mysteries. It seems to come from Greek sources, because many of the words used are Greek. And it could well be that we have here the modern beginnings of an attempted revival of ancient mysteries. Whatever it is, it is not one of those fanciful and spurious ones which used to be printed merely to attract the credulous, because it is plausible in containing the sort of material which might well have formed the content of an initiation and mind conditioning system. And if you understand the secret religions as I do, and specifically the modern ones, you will quickly recognize this as authentic. The earliest version known is in the form of an anonymous pamphlet, probably not intended for public sale, of 30-odd pages printed in 1785. <laughs> Right in that area of history is momentous occurrences. It was republished in a French translation 30 years later, purporting to be the ritual of the Master Degree in Freemasonry. And if you know anything about the Master Degree in Freemasonry, you will soon see that it certainly <laughs> is exact in its descriptions. The French editor claims that it is a composite ritual derived from the works of some 15 Greek and Roman writers. This degree, we are told, was open to Egyptian kings and priests alone, and only those specially recommended by an initiate could enter it. The usual procedure was that the Pharaoh himself introduced the candidate to the priests. By them he was sent from Heliopolis, the city of the sun, and you'll never escape from the sun when you're studying the mysteries, to the Memphis priests. From there he went to Thebes. He was circumcised, forbidden to eat pulch or fish, and generally had to abstain from wine. He was put for several months in an underground cave and asked to write down his reflections. When he had done this, he was led to a passage supported by the pillars of Hermes, where he had to learn certain things which were inscribed thereon. As soon as he was word perfect, the Thesmorphus, or the introducer, came to him with a strong whip to keep the uninitiated or the profane at bay. He was blindfolded and his hands bound with cords. Now follows the procedure from the first degree of the select body. The candidate was led to the gate of men, where the introducer touched the shoulder of an apprentice, Portophorus, standing there on guard. He, in turn, knocked on the gate, which was opened. When the aspirant entered, he was questioned on various manners by the hierophant. 
after which he was led around the Barantha in an artificial storm of wind, rain, thunder, and lightning. If he showed no sign of fear, Minis, the expounder, explained the laws of the Krata Rapoa, to which he had to agree. He was then taken in front of the Hierophant, made to kneel, and vowed fidelity with a sword point at his throat. As witness, he called upon the sun, moon, and stars. And where have you heard that before? His eyes were then unbandaged, and he was placed between two spare pillars called Batiles, where lay a ladder of seven steps, behind which were eight doors of different metals of gradually increasing purity. The Hierophant, then addressing those present, as many Musai, or children of the work of celestial investigation, extorted them to govern their passions and fix their thoughts upon God. Now the sun, the moon, and the stars, you should know by now, represent the doctrine, the church, and the initiates. The sun, of course, is the doctrine, the moon is the church, and the stars are the body of initiates, or the thousand points of light. The candidate was taught, folks, that the latter symbolized the wanderings of the soul. He was told the causes of wind, thunder, and lightning, and given other valuable information, such as medical lore. He was given the password of recognition of this degree, which was and I spell it because I don't know the correct pronunciation, A-M-O-U-N, meaning secrecy. He was taught a grip, given a pyramidal cap and an apron called Zylon. Around his neck was a collar, and he wore no other clothes. His duty was to guard the gate of men in his turn. The Porto Forus was now able, after showing his devotion, to proceed to the second degree. Following a prolonged fast, he was taken into a dark chamber called Indemian, the Invitation Grotto. He was now of the degree of Neocorus. Handsome women brought him dainty food. They were the wives of the priest who endeavored to excite his love. If he resisted these advances, he was further lectured by the master of ceremonies and led into an assembly where the stolista, or water-bearer, poured water over him. Then a living serpent was thrown at him. The whole room was full of snakes to test his courage. He was then led to two high pillars between which stood a griffin driving a wheel before him. The pillars symbolized east and west. The griffin, the sun, and the wheel of four spokes, the four seasons. He was taught the use of the level and instructed in geometry and architecture. He received a rod entwined by serpents, and that rod is still used today by the medical community. It's called the caducus. And he received the past word, heave, meaning serpent, and was told the story of the fall of man. The sign consisted in crossing the arms over the chest, and his duty was to wash the pillars. Now, when the initiate was initiated into the third degree, the member was given the title of Melanophorus. He was led to an anteroom over whose door was written, Gate of Death. The room was full of copies of of embalmed bodies and coffins. Here, too, were a number of dissectors, embalmers, and so on. In the center stood the coffin of Osiris. The Melanophorus was asked if he had had a hand in the assassination of his master. On his denying the question, he was seized by two Tapic sites are men who buried the dead and led into a hall where he found all the other melanophores clothed in black. The king himself, who always was present on these occasions, addressed him in an apparently friendly way, begging him 
if he did not feel courage enough to undergo the test now to be applied to him to accept the golden crown he was offering him. Well, he had already been coached to refuse the crown and tread it underfoot. At this insult, the king called for revenge. Raising his sacrificial axe, he touched the head of the initiate. And in one famous initiation, the king actually beheaded the man. The two corpse carriers threw him on the ground, and the embalmers wrapped him in bandages. All who were present wept. Now he was led to a gate over which was written, Sanctuary of the Spirits. Now the initiate was not supposed to be beheaded in that one famous initiation. And I don't know what they chalked that up to. Now, standing before the gate, the initiate waited. On its being opened, thunder and lightning struck the apparently dead man. Chan received him as a spirit into his boat and carried him to the judges of Hades. Pluto sat on his judgment seat, while Radamanthus and Minos, as well as Athon, Nicreus, Alastor, and Orpheus stood beside him. Very severe questions were put to him as to his former life, and finally he was sentenced to remain in these subterranean vaults. Now remember, this is an, in an initiation, which sometimes lasts for months and even years. The bandages were removed, and he was told never to desire blood, never to leave a corpse unburied, and to believe in the resurrection of the dead and the judgment to come. Now remember, this is long centuries before Christianity. He was taught coffin decoration and the peculiar hierogrammatical script. The sign was an embrace to express the days of wrath. He was kept in these underground chambers until thought fit to proceed to a higher degree. These, quote, days of wrath, unquote, generally lasted for a year and a half until the initiate was ready for promotion to the fourth degree. The Battle of the Shades. He was handed a sword and a shield and taken through dark passages. He met certain persons presenting a frightful appearance, carrying torches and serpents. He was attacked with the cry of Panis. He defended himself bravely, but was always taken prisoner. His eyes were bandaged and a cord placed around his neck. Dragging him into a hall, the specters disappeared. He was led into the assembly of initiates and his eyes unbandaged. Before him he saw a magnificent hall decorated with beautiful paintings. The king and the highest dignitary, the demiurgos, were present. All were wearing their alidai, an Egyptian order composed of sapphires. Among those present were the secretary, the treasurer, and the master of feats. The orator made a speech congratulating the new member on his fortitude. He was given a drink called Sais, which he drank to the dregs. And this was probably the ritual drink of honey or milk, water, wine, and gruel, and perhaps some hypnotic drug. He donned the boots of Anubis, took up the shield of Isis, put on the cloak and cap of Orcus. He was handed a sword and told that he must cut off the head of the next person he met in a cave and bring it back to the king. This cave was pointed out to him. Entering it, he saw what seemed to be a beautiful woman, but in reality was a model of one. Now notice it's a woman. He seized this by the hair and severed the head. This he brought back to the monarch who praised him, telling him that he had symbolically won the head of the Gorgon, wife of Typhon, who had caused the death of Osiris. He was now permitted always to wear the dress which had been given to him, and he was entered in a book as one of the judges of the land. Notice that, one of the judges of the land. He was able to communicate at any time with the king and received an allowance from the court. He was invested with an order, that of Isis in the shape of an owl, 
And it was revealed to him that the secret name of the great lawgiver was J-O-A, Joah, which was also the password of this degree. But the password for the meetings of the Christophori, as the fourth degree initiates were called, was Sassicus. The fifth degree, that of Balahate, could not now be refused to the Chrysophorus if he demanded or requested it. He was led to a hall to watch a play at which he was the only onlooker. Other members of the degree went through the hall as if looking for something. One drew his sword and the terrible figure of Typhon appeared. Of course he was slain. And now the due Balahate was told that Typhon represented fire, a terrible element which was at the same time indispensable. The password was Chimia, and the teaching was in chemistry, or alchemy. In order to become an astronomer of the gate of the gods, the sixth degree, the candidate was taken to the hall of assembly, bound and led to the gate of death. He was shown corpses which had been cast into water, and warned that he might be similarly treated if he broke his oath. He was given some teaching in astronomy and taken back to the gate of the gods, where he looked at the pictures of the gods while their histories were explained to him. A priestly dance took place, symbolizing the course of the heavenly bodies. He saw a list of members of the order throughout the world and learned the password Ibis for watchfulness. The last and the highest degree was that of Propheta, in which all secrets were laid bare. It was conferred following public processions, and when the permission of the king and all the highest members had been obtained, the members secretly left the city by night and retired to some houses built in a square and surrounded by pillars by the sides of which were placed alternately a shield and a coffin whose rooms were painted with representations of human life. Now these houses were called Maneras, for the people believed them to be visited by the manes of departed men. On their arrival at these houses, the new member, now called Prophet, or Saphanath Panka, a man who knows the secrets, was given a drink called Oimelas, and told that now all trials were over. He received a cross of peculiar significance, which he was always to wear. He was clothed in a wide, white-striped dress called Itangi. The usual sign was crossing his arms in his wide sleeves. He could peruse all the sacred books written in the Ammonite language. His greatest privilege was having a vote in the election of a king, and the password was Adan. These mystical societies always continued, and one of special interest is the powerful society in Afghanistan in ancient times called the Roshaniya, or Illuminated Ones. There are actually references to this mystical cult going all the way back through history to the House of Wisdom at Cairo. The major tenets of this cult were the abolition of private property, the elimination of religion, the elimination of nation-states, the belief that illumination emanated from the supreme being who desired a class of perfect men and women to carry out the organization and direction of the world, belief in a plan to reshape the social system of the world by first taking control of individual countries one by one, and the belief that after reaching the fourth degree one could communicate directly with the unknown supervisors who had imparted knowledge to initiates throughout the ages. The Roshaniya also called themselves the Order. Initiates took an oath that absolved them of all allegiance except to the Order and stated, quote, I bind myself to perpetual silence and unshaken loyalty and submission to the Order. All humanity which cannot identify itself by our secret sign is our lawful prey, unquote. The oath remains essentially the same to this day. The secret sign was to pass a hand over the forehead, palm inward, the countersign to hold the ear with the fingers and support the elbow in the cupped other hand. 
Does that sound familiar? If you sit in a courtroom in just about any city in this land, you will see those signs exchanged between lawyers and defendants and judges. And you will see that whenever that these signs are exchanged, whoever initiated the exchange will usually, in fact, most often does, win the court case. The order, of course, is the order of the quest. And the cult preached that there was no heaven, no hell, only a spirit state completely different from life as we know it. The spirit could continue to be powerful on earth through a member of the order, but only if the spirit had been itself a member of the order before its death. Thus, members of the order gained power from the spirits of the dead members. The Roshaniya took in travelers as initiates and then sent them on their way to found new chapters of the order, and they were called fellow travelers. You see this order, as all before it, and all since, are socialists, communists. It is believed by some that the assassins were a branch of the Roshaniya. And branches of the Roshaniya are the illuminated ones, or the Illuminati exist and still exist everywhere. One of the rules was not to use the same name and never mention, quote, Illuminati, unquote. That rule is still in effect today, and it's probably the breaking of that rule that resulted in Adam Weishaupt's downfall. Remember, folks, that we have really only just begun, and you are just beginning to understand, although some of you may think that you already understand, I can assure you that maybe a very small minority of you really do. Most do not. We have a long way to go in this history and in your own particular individual illumination. <laughs> oh, I just love it. I just love it, exposing these people who claim that they are doing everything for the benefit of mankind, who really have all the guilt for most of everything bad that has ever happened to mankind resting squarely upon their shoulders. Now, if you'd like a packet of information, if you'd like to know how to join Kaji, if you'd like to purchase my book, or if you'd like to donate to pay for the airtime of this show, make a check or money order out to WWCR. That's to pay for the airtime. And send it to Stan, along with your request for information and whatever else that you may wish. Send it to Stan, P.O. Box 889, Camp Verde, Arizona, 86322. That's Stan, P.O. Box 889, Camp Verde, Arizona, 86322. Or you can call Stan and talk to him on the phone. He's a really wonderful guy. You'll enjoy it. Call him at 602-567-6109. That's 602-567-6109. Next time, folks, we're going to talk about the old man of the mountain. And we're going to continue the history of the order through the ages. Good night, and God bless you all.